Have you ever received a promotion in which your manager becomes your peer? If you have, you know it's a big transition on top of an already big transition. The intensity of the change in relationship will depend on the relationship you already had with your former manager, but even in the best circumstances, it will be a little unsettling, especially if you have differing opinions in a management meeting. I have Liz Johnson with me for a coaching episode of the podcast today, and this is one of the things that we're discussing. Let me tell you a little bit about Liz. Liz Johnson is the Vice President of Research and Development for a private mid-size biopolymer company located in the upper Midwest of the United States. She holds a bachelor's in chemistry and a PhD in material science and engineering specializing in, I'm going to see if I can get this right, implantable polymeric biomaterials. She'll talk a little bit about what that means in just a bit. Liz grew up on the East Coast, studied in the Midwest and West Coast, and now she's back in the Midwest where she lives with her husband, three kids, and two dogs. Liz's passion is bringing people, process, and technology together to launch great products. In this coaching episode, Liz and I discussed how homing in on your personal mission will help you navigate career choices strategies for reducing overwhelm and setting priorities, reframing your perspective, and questions to ask your team to identify opportunities to delegate, how to gain buy-in when decisions need to be made quickly, and finding common ground with someone you used to report to who is now your peer. This is going to be a good one, so stay tuned. And if you are new to the Women Taking the Lead podcast, hello and welcome. I'm Jody Flynn, the CEO and founder of Women Taking the Lead, a leadership development company that helps leaders to achieve their gender parity goals at all levels of leadership and in all divisions of an organization. We help to realize these results through coaching, consulting, leadership development programs, and keynotes. My goal is for this podcast to be a valuable resource for you and others in your organization to grow in your leadership. If we are not already connected on LinkedIn, please send me an invitation to connect. You can find me directly at linkedin.com forward slash IN forward slash Jody Flynn, or you can search on the platform for Jody Flynn. I'm very active on LinkedIn, so I should be at or near the top of the search results. Be sure to add a note to the invitation, letting me know you're a listener of the podcast. I would love to connect with you and get to know you better. Now, let's bring on Liz. Welcome to the Women Taking the Lead podcast, Liz. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me on today, Jody. Oh, I'm excited. So... Let everyone know a little bit about you and the work you do, just to create some context for them. So um, my name is Liz. My background actually is that I am current role as vice president of leading research and development, actually at a mid-sized private company. And my background has been a little varied. I have a Bachelor of Arts in Chemistry. And then I actually went for a PhD in material science and engineering, more in the biomedical and plantable polymers field. And I've worked at both public small companies and public large companies. And so I've been enjoying looking at different business models and kind of working in different industries, but always on polymers, in particular biopolymers. And my current company, we're in the Midwest, and we're really focused on creating polymers from um, bio-based feedstocks such as corn and sugar so that they're renewable plastics to replace the petrochemical based plastics that you may find in you know the packaging that you use in your food cups and disposable plates and other things like that so that's what we're aiming to do oh, I and love that. <laughs> 
I, yeah, it really brings together everything that I've loved working on in my career. Um, I worked as a bench scientist and product developer and then got really involved and in, interested in how do you bring technology to market? And what I've really landed on is my passion is I love bringing people together and process and new technology to launch great products because it really takes all of those things to get a new invention out the door and onto a, a shelf in your store. Oh my gosh, Liz, you've got your mission statement right there. Do you know, I have some clients where we work on like their mission statement. Like, what is your mission statement? What do you yeah. want to contribute to the world and your organization? And you just like, boom, that came right off your tongue. It's something I thought a lot about and actually worked on and had some great coaching at one of my jobs. We got to be part of kind of, it took us through a workshop on figuring out, right, what kind of makes you tick? And I've refined it over time, actually. I've I've added pieces and I've purposely switched things around where people are now first, because I realized if you don't have the right people and connections in place, the other, the other pieces don't work. So thanks for the compliment. I appreciate it. Yeah. And you know, it's true when it lights you up and every bit of it, you look at it and go, all of that is true. 100%. And it really helps. I think when you're identifying a new job, as far as where you might want to move, to know if it checks the boxes for what you see as your mission. That's been helpful for me. So I know it's not something, especially as a scientist that you're taught to do in school, (laughs) kind of work on your own brand, but it's been really powerful actually. Yeah. And I wondered too, when you said you'd bounced around different size companies, public, private, large, small, and now you're in the mid-size private. I wondered if you'd found your sweet spot or if you're still like, I'm still exploring and, you know, getting a feel. I think I'm still exploring and still getting a feel. I've been in my current job just over two years and in my current role, about three months, um, my role switched in reporting structure. And I think we'll talk about that a little more, that that's the big change I underwent is my role had been part of a kind of in layers of organization and it got elevated to report to the CEO about mm-hmm. three months ago. And so that was a big change for me and, you know, what's expected of me and my role. And then also our company's gone through a lot of change. So that's why I really can't answer if this is the right fit or not yet, because we're going through so much change. We actually have had a number of CEO transitions, including an interim, and just got our permanent CEO appointed three weeks ago. So a lot of uncertainty. That's a lot of change. That's a role change, a reporting change, and then having the CEO, who's the authority figure at the top. and. Yep. Typically, the person who where it's not like the the whole culture of the company and company brand circles around the CEO, but it definitely emanates from them. It definitely emanates them from them. And then also knowing that they're my boss at this point, too. So there's that dynamic of, oh, I'm on my third boss this year. OK, how am I going to figure out what they need from me and how am I am I fitting into what they had in in mind? Yeah. for the head of the R&D organization. So. Okay, so this is great. That is a great segue, Liz. So why, why don't we just yeah. dive in because we're there. So tell me um, what it, what is the challenge that you're faced with? I mean, I think everyone has kind of a sense like that's a lot, but like if you were yeah. to get specific on what is the challenge, what would you say it is? Yeah, it's hard to sum it up. Of course, I think that's maybe one of the things, I don't know if others feel this way too, of even being able to put into words what the mm-hmm. stress is coming from. You just know you feel stressed. Yeah. And I think a lot of it for me is believing that my best is good enough <laughs> and that I'm up to this, everything that life is throwing at me. And I should have mentioned too that, so I am married to another scientist engineer and we ha- works for full time and we have three kids that span the gamut from high school, middle school and elementary school. <laughs> and so <laughs> I think that's why I say feeling inadequate. It's like, OK, am I doing a good job at work, at home, as a parent, as a spouse? And so I think perhaps addressing some of my areas of stress could help right, boost that self-confidence. I suppose mm-hmm. it's a, an upward spiral if you can start the the reaction occurring. Yeah. In my mind, 
like I am now con- connecting with the listeners who there are some of you out there who are, have a very similar situation to Liz and you're like, oh my goodness, I can't wait to hear what comes out of this conversation because that is that is my life. Not all the details might be the same, but that sounds like my life. And there are some people who are like, oh, Lord have mercy. <laughs> <laughs> goodness. Goodness, goodness, goodness. Okay. So part of it is really like, there's just a lot. And so I imagine it just feels a little bit overwhelming. Am I keeping up with everything? Am I living up to my expectations, their expectations in all of these different areas? So how do you even name where the stress is coming from? Because all of it feels right. And there is, um, I know a lot of people don't like the word overwhelm, but what what is happening when we get into overwhelm is there's just little fires all over the place. Like everything feels on fire. Right. And you can't, so you can't determine which one's more important because your mind is going, everything is on fire, all of it, all at once right Mm now. (laughs) That is a great way of summarizing. It's interesting you say that because it's something my husband and I have talked about. I use the word overwhelmed and it really is a trigger for him because then he's like, well, I have no idea what to do with that feedback. Because I guess what I am describing is there's all these little fires, but I haven't been able to put into words what each of those fires is mm-hmm. to even seek help addressing, putting them out. Right. Or even see where to begin, you know, and that, that can en- end up making yeah. you feel like you're ping ponging through your day because Definitely. it's whatever's right in front of you. You're like, oh my God, it's on fire. I have to work on this. But then right. you look to your right and you're like, oh my God, that's on fire too. Let me spend time on that. And at the end of the day, yes. you're like, what did I even do today? What did right. I accomplish? The things that were on my list, they're all still on my list because the other fires came up. And I know I listened to one of your podcasts where you were talking to Kelly Nolan about the bright method. And yeah. I have been putting time on my calendar. She was talking about scheduling really specific time though, to work on specific things and holding yourself accountable to kind of get it out of your head. And I was like, Oh, (laughs) so I was even trying that the last two weeks. And I have to say, I think that's something if I can get in more of a rhythm of really time boxing. Yes. What I'm working on and what I'm getting done. Well, it'll feel calmer too, because you could see progress against the firefighting. Yes. And I bet it's already helping a little bit because it it is is getting it out of your head when you see it on paper and you see it on a list, then it's easier to say, okay, this needs to get done first before I can do this. And I'm carving out time for family. So that will happen then. And I will not, but it like more of it now is like the discipline of like, okay, if I've carved out time for this to focus on it. it. Yeah. Yes. And also getting it off your to-do list of, and I think you had mentioned it maybe two of the things that you're not, you're forgetting. That's my other big kind of worry and fear that gnaws is what <laughs> ball have I dropped? Yes. What, <laughs> what will catch me tomorrow that I completely. <laughs> that I absolutely relate to, which is why, um, I love Google calendar because it integrates yes. with Google tasks And if I need to do something, I add a task to that day, right? So I know I'm not going to forget this. Like it lives on my calendar on the day it needs to get done. If I can get even more specific than that, it might be this time block. That is when this is getting done and I'm holding it sacred. Um, Yeah. And then my mind doesn't have to hold on to it because back in the day, I I think I, I would have driven myself crazy because all my mind would do would go through the list one more time oh, yeah. so I wouldn't forget. And then I make another list and I would annoy people because people would be like, how are you? And I'd be like, oh my God, I'm so busy. And I'd start rattling yeah. off my list. <laughs> and I was like, this madness must yeah. stop. And it did yeah. stop when I did. Okay start putting things on the task list. Cause then my mind went, I don't have to hold on to this because the calendar is holding it for me. I just need to check my calendar every day. 
which we already do because we live in this digital world. So we do live in that digital world. I think it'll be very helpful because I had been using right Microsoft and Outlook and it gives you focus time, but then it's a block. And yeah. I find that the things I thought I'd use the block for, I've right, I pivoted and put out some other fire. And I did that last week actually to myself. And it was a really big learning. So I'm sure others are going through it's the end of the year. It's annual review time. Mm. and we need to get them all in plus it's holiday season there's just so much that goes on at the end of the year and I block time but I hadn't really specifically said I'm going to do this piece of the work that I need to get done and I realized I didn't get any of it done because other things came up and so this week I'm being much more mindful of really tight descriptions like you're saying of what exactly I'm going to get done in this hour this half hour so Mm -hmm. So yes. far, so good. Yes. And also being able to assign some priority to things. Like it's yeah. helpful when things have deadlines. Now, sometimes they are made up deadlines. Like we make up a deadline for why we want yeah. something to get done. But then sometimes there are actually drop dead deadlines and they must right. be submitted by this time. That definitely can help in setting the priority. Like, right, it does Maybe. this need to get done by tomorrow? And this other thing can, has a few more days. Well, then I, I'm focusing on the most urgent, at least like yeah. moving things off the task list. Now there's a whole nother, you know, um, the I'm thinking of the um, is it the Eisenhower quadrants? It definitely comes up in um Gay Hendricks book, The Big Leap, where there are tasks that are. So what you're looking at with every task is like what level of urgency it Ah. has and then also what level of importance does it have? So then there's four boxes, four quadrants that you put things into like not urgent and not important. And those are typically like social media. (laughs) Right. Right. Like, like things that like we do, you might do them because they like help you relax or take your brain off of things, but they're really low priority, low urgency. And then there might be not urgent, but important. Right. So that's a really good point. And I use the four quadrants looking at different problems that I face at work and I've never used it for. Ah, so you're very familiar with it. Okay. Very interesting. Right. So just so you on um, you've done it. this before, but yeah. just to complete the circle for everyone else who's following along. So yeah. then the other two quadrants are urgent but unimportant, and then urgent and important. So obviously anything that lands in urgent and important, we want to take care of first. We want to make sure we're blocking time for the things that are not urgent but important. And then yeah. the, you know, and then looking at you know, urgent, but unimportant things that those might be things you can delegate as well. You Ah, which I want to touch on. Yes, is delegation. It's interesting that the quadrant where how I've used it, and I use it quite a bit is um, often driving change in the roles that I've had, and bringing organizations or groups along with me. And so there's that kind of change quadrant of people and stakeholders, if you have Mm -hmm. people who will be kind of either for a change, against a change, or kind of, you know, in between, doesn't matter, and then how Mm -hmm. much influence they have. And so I've used that as far as, are they going to be big proponents and very influential, then you want to get those on boards quick, so that they can help champion with you. If you have folks that are very influential, and you think won't be for the change, you need to help mitigate that and bring them along. So it's interesting to think, oh, I could use that also in my like daily life. I love that. I had not heard this one using the same four quadrants, Mm -hmm. but ranking by influence and for or against change. Yeah. So it helps you build your champion team and Mm -hmm. know who you'll need to try to mitigate or bring along. Right. And what conversations do you need to have or FAQs do you need to put together to And the urgency and the importance (laughs) of having which conversations first. Yes. I love this. Right. It's just tools to help us start like naming the priority and the sequence of how things should get done. 
No, that's really helpful because, right, that's exactly how I plan out which conversations to have because there's so many that you do need to have or ones that you can put on the back burner. Mm -hmm. Interesting for tasks. And it does bring up, you had um, touched on the delegation piece. And definitely what I'm finding in my new role is I think many of us have I've definitely tended towards that um, kind of perfectionism, wanting to do everything right, wanting to do everything myself. Mm-hmm. And yet, you know, in the role that I, I have had, or even this new one that can't do it all. And you, can't. you are the vice president. Re- yeah, you're the vice president reporting right. to the CEO. You cannot be doing all the things anymore. It's not That's to say right. like you have a whole new set of all the things. Right. That I you are now responsible for. Really. <laughs> work that I need to do and I need to be bringing up a team to grow into, right. The role I had, like you said, developing a team. Yeah. And, and I luckily was having some coaching um, from one member of our team that was a consultant. And so he's offered to kind of keep working with me too, but he was the one that pointed out, he's like, you should have delegated that. And I was Mm -hmm. like, huh? And he's like, right. You're doing the work for a team. Why didn't you ask the team to do it? And I was like, oh, because I used to lead the teams, right? <laughs> like, I right? I know how to do manager. this. Yes, right. I and it was unfair of me to have not let the team do that, and it put way more work on me. Yeah, you know, and it probably wasn't as good of an outcome. So it was very. I was thankful for the really kind of open feedback, and it was eye opening. But I'm realizing there's a lot likely other situations where I do the same thing? And how do you recognize those as the opportunities to delegate instead of falling back to my kind of base programming of I'll do it myself? Right, right. I actually had, I just had a client say to me today, she was like, I made a name for myself in my career doing this. Let's call it X. She's like, so I know I have to stop doing it. And giving it to my team yep. so they can make a name for themselves on doing this work. So one question you can ask yourself is, could somebody else do this? Do I oh. need to be the one ah. that does this or could yeah. somebody else do this? Would this be a great learning opportunity for someone on the team. And especially once you know what their goals are and what yeah. sort of professional development they're looking for, they may actually give you ideas for what they'd be willing a great point. to yeah. take on, right? Like have this be a partnership conversation. Like, Hey, let's, let's take a look at your goals, what you're looking to okay. develop in the coming year. And as we're yeah. like oh, heading into a new year, it's a great time to have this conversation really either before everyone leaves for the holidays or a- as they're coming back. And I'm sure what happens is when people take time off during the holidays too, like, it's not like we want, we don't want to be consumed with work, but we do right. kind of take a step back and think about Am I enjoying work? What kind of things do I want to do at work? And when we can get to a state where we feel rested, we actually have more meaningful reflections around this, you know, like, how do I want to contribute at work? And so out of those conversations, you may come up with a list of things of like, okay, what we're going to make a plan. I'm going to start transitioning this work to you, or when a project comes up, I want you to step forward and volunteer to take this on. And that could naturally start taking some things off your plate. I really appreciate how you framed it up because I did write down the two questions because that always helps me to keep them kind of front in my notebook of questions that I should be asking. And I absolutely appreciate and I'm really passionate about development. And it's one thing I did actually at the large public company that I was at was in their technical leadership forum, working on how do you retain and develop scientists. And it was something we delved into a lot. And a piece of it, you're right, is a lot of times we don't know what we're looking for next. It's those dialogues and conversations that we can help each other kind of tease out like, oh, have you ever thought of, I hear you say you enjoy this, you might also enjoy that. Mm-hmm. So we've been starting to do that in our organization and our managers have been really enjoying it. And I think employees too. So I love layering that on of, okay, now how do we tie that to 
taking action on as we're identifying these interests. Yes. Yep. And the new year is a great time to do that. Yep. And if you still have some tasks that are lingering where it's like, I'm not the one who needs to do it, you can also look into assigning it as well. It's interesting to touch on that. That is something I had a, um, an all group meeting this morning. And that was one of our themes was we haven't been doing that. And we're going to start doing more of assigning of responsibilities because we're getting leaner and tighter on budgets. And we've got to just kind of pitch in and get stuff done. So yeah, very interesting. That was yes. Right. We're communicating. Okay. But you're going to give everyone an opportunity to say what they want first. And then if there are things left over and, or somebody hasn't taken on some new things in a while, then it's like, okay, you do this. And cause this is the thing Liz, there are things on, on your task list or in your responsibilities that nobody else, but you can do them. And so you must have time set aside for those things. And it seems so simple. And yet when you say it, I'm like, oh, yes, that's a light bulb. You're right. That's what I have to identify are the pieces that are really mine that I need to do myself. And then there's a ton of other work that could be opportunities for others. Mm -hmm, For sure. Yeah. So I think that's a big challenge for me in the new year or opportunity, I should say. (laughs) <laughs> it's okay to call it both, right? It's, it is both a challenge and an opportunity. Isn't that why we started using the word opportunities? We're like, so. these are your strengths mm-hmm. and these are your opportunities for improvement, right? Right, <laughs> so right. It's a yeah. nicer spin on these are your weaknesses. This is your because, because really like, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's all perspective and mindset, but it is yeah. what it is. It is an opportunity, right? If you were yeah. able to tackle this, start delegating. It freed up your time so that you could do your best work on the things that you cannot delegate. Right. So, I mean, and, and, and those are crucial too, with the relationship that you're building with this new CEO as well. Are you getting value from listening to the women taking the lead podcast? If so, could you do me a huge favor? Could you leave a rating and a review in your favorite podcast app? Ratings and reviews make a podcast easier to discover and written reviews let a potential listener know whether or not a podcast might be of interest to them. Podcast reviews lend social proof that listening to the episode is worth someone's time. So if you would be open to leaving a review, go into the Women Taking the Lead podcast show page in your favorite podcast app. Every app is different, but if you can't find a setting near the top of the screen, you can just scroll down a bit to find it. For instance, on Spotify, click on the three dots to the right of the setting wheel, but on Apple Podcasts, it's about halfway down the show page. Thank you so much. I see all the ratings and reviews and each one makes a difference. And we've had a lot of change in our organization and I've been in other groups where we've had quite a bit of change, but I think this is more compressed than I've had it before Mm -hmm. of in our um, C-suite of our three chief officers, two will have been new in the last year. And with one, we've had an interim. And then also same thing on on my level of vice presidents, we've had two leave and one come all in the last two months. Wow. Okay. So it's a lot of, right. How are we going to work together? What do we want the direction of the ship to be? And knowing that people have been through a lot of change also that if, right, if I'm feeling unnerved by it, I'm sure lots of others are too. Mm -hmm. Yes. And there's a team dynamic at the senior level. You're still gelling and figuring out how to work together and, you know, how to collaborate and partner on different things. And that was one thing I know that you and I had touched on um, just when we first met was that um, for those listening, uh, as my role moved to report to the CEO, I used to report to the chief operating officer. And so now he is more my peer than my boss. And that switch in roles has been something that I've also been 
I've realized has been a challenge for me and just how I'm interacting. And it was something that actually a colleague pointed out that I tend to back down. I'm, I'm pretty, I don't know, vocal and forceful, but they said they notice a difference when I interact with that person that will be in a group setting. And if that person disagrees with me, I back down. And they're like, you don't back down to anyone else. Mm -hmm. What's going on? And it's like, oh, I hadn't even realized it. You're right. I'm. We often will not agree on something because we have different views. And how do I constructively engage instead of just backing down? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So this is... um you and I touched on this when we first yeah. talked, but we didn't go deep into it because we wanted to save it for, right. for this call as well, that your relationship is changing. What you're looking at is, I would compare it to, though, of course, it's not exactly like, almost like when you go off to college and you leave your parents' house. Yep. Yep. And then you're used to, like, you get into a rhythm of, like, I make choices for myself or even when you get your first job, you know, but your your yeah. parent, you know, but your parents still somewhat interact with you like you're yeah. still a little girl or you find yeah. yourself deferring to them in ways yeah. where, you know, you want to be respectful of them, but you're like, why am I doing this? Like, I don't want to sort of thing. It's because your, your relationship is morphing and you okay. haven't gotten to the other side yet. So but this is just yeah. part of you okay. needing to detach from him as your boss yeah. and reform the relationship as your peer. And so you're in these okay. automatic habits, right? If this person yeah. was still your boss and he was like, Liz, we're going this way. You'd be like, okay, we're going that way. Yeah. <laughs> and that is, that's what you're telling me we're doing. Like I, you probably offered your perspective insights, right. but once he was like, this is the way we're going. You were like, okay, I've been, I've said my piece. Mm -hmm. He still wants to go this way. So that's what we're doing. That's not true anymore. Right. So this is going to be a little bit of an identity shift for you. And find, so how can you remind yourself that he is your peer now? Oh, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I, I think I'll have to think on that unless you have some suggestions. That's Like I said, I often keep notes or tips to myself in the front of the notebook. Maybe that's yeah. something to remember. The one colleague that was mentoring me that was a consultant was just remembering that I have the decision right now, decision rights, that especially in conversations with my old boss, I tend to forget that I have decision rights. Mm. And so I wonder if even writing a note to myself of. I have a right to this. To decision. Decide. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Like How we ha we have. You? equal weight. Well, right. And I do really value their opinion. Mm -hmm. But you're right. In the end, we'd always have these great dialogues and kind of debates. And it was always very healthy. But in the end, if we disagreed, the decision was his. Right. Whereas now, for my organization for research and development, the decision is mine. And we do see different ways of working on certain aspects, which is going to be very interesting. Yeah. So I want you to envision yourself in a conversation with him and you're okay. both very passionate yes. about your point of views and you're kind of batting things back and forth. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Well, something you should know is da 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 da. And at the end, he's like, I think we should go in this direction. And you hear yourself saying, I respectfully disagree. Oh. And we're going to go in this direction. How does that feel? We've recently had a discussion like that. I did not phrase it that way. And I really appreciate that phrasing. In fact, I'll jot that one down. <laughs> right. Making it very 
plain and clear of recognizing we disagree and still I'm going to hold my decision right and make the decision. Yeah. Um, what one thing we found recently is that we need to kind of draw it out. So using a whiteboard, luckily we're both in person again after COVID. And okay. we realized that we often are verbally, we can't seem to come to alignment on certain topics. And yet, as we would whiteboard it, we've done this twice now. And it was really interesting because we realized we're trying to solve the same root problem, but we just had different ways of describing a solution. And actually, as we started to whiteboard them, we were like, wait a second, the two ways of working, it was a process for working, they actually are complementary. So what if you could keep what we have and layer on some changes? It was an interesting, but if we hadn't gotten out markers and each been drawing, I think we would still be arguing over it. That's incredibly insightful. So could there be opportunities in the future where you could say, I think we should table this for now uh, and yeah. you and I meet at the whiteboard <laughs> I like it, <laughs> and we draw it out. Oh, that's a great line. And that would work really well for the two of us. Yes. Because yes, the rest of the room like, might be like, what's going on? <laughs> but I, it sounds it like there are certain us. things yeah. where other people don't want to weigh in on the decision anyway, or they're fine with whatever you decide. But you and he both need to get to a place where you can see where the other is coming from. Yeah. No, I love it. And you're right. We could do that even in right the heat of the moment. Just say, oh, right. Let's table this. and." Find some time for the whiteboard. Yeah. And you're right. I think it would make him smile. <laughs> it would make me smile. Yes. Because <laughs> it sounds like you're both visual too, right? So that's that can be mm -hmm. some of the, the trickiness of that's it too, true. trying to verbalize mm -hmm. things when both of you need to see it drawn out. Yeah. And I hadn't thought of it that way. And you're right. I think that is absolutely it. And realizing that we were both seeing things actually very similarly, but thinking we were at complete odds. I think that is so beautiful. And I love that you shared that because, you know, for me, I always, I do want everyone to feel good about the ultimate decision. I right. know there are certain times where like, we're just not going to get there. We haven't found out how to get there, but it sounds like you've discovered something like an avenue where the two of you can get to a place where it's like, oh, okay, we're talking about the same thing using different terms. Different terms. Yes. And that what we had, it was interesting. It's taken us over two years, <laughs> but <laughs> it's still really a win. It's still, no, and we both, and it, you're right, I think a big piece of it is probably for both of us, want others to be on board with the decision and feel good about it, whatever the decision is you're making. And yeah, our past discussions would leave us both feeling negative, yeah. right, unresolved. And with, yeah, and with so much change going on, you do want yeah. everyone to feel as comfortable as possible with how we're moving forward and what we're doing. Yeah. It'll make huge difference. It was interesting, actually. I started my meeting this morning just with like a pulse survey. You can use like, different online you know, surveys. So I had them scan a QR code and kind of pick four rankings of like, are you low stress, kind of peak performance, mid stress? Or are you kind of over the edge into imbalance? Or are you really like, I'm, I'm flat out? And I think it was really good because actually my whole team was like, actually, we're, we're past the peak performance. We're into stress. We are, we're out of balance and you're right. I think everybody feels change and I hope that others felt the same way I did of, well, at least like we're not alone. Like our whole group is feeling this way. So maybe we can make it okay to talk about it some. So encouraging people to do that. But I, I heard some kind of like, whoa, you know, in the room, it was like, wait, the majority of us, we all this feel this show? way. <sighs> Right. And what can, like, and we can talk through, like, what do we want right. to do about this? That sort of thing. Like, nor, like not normalizing being that stressed, but no. normalizing oh. talking about being oh. that stressed. 
And what are we going to do? Just acknowledging it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what can you do? Right. You said like, what can we do as a team to help ourselves get back into the green zone of healthy, Mm -hmm. more balanced stress? Because right. We don't want to stay there. But no, no. Awesome. All right. What else do you have for me? (laughs) was interesting. I think one of the other um, pieces that we were just touching on that segues really nicely is we were talking about how in making decisions, I think it's human nature. We want people to be on board and people to be happy with that decision. And yet that's not the reality when we have different perspectives and voices that no decision will be perfect for everybody. And particularly in my new role, and having decision rights and reporting to the CEO, knowing that in the past, I've really relied on consensus and I've wanted everybody to feel good before a decision was made, Mm -hmm. but can't do that always now. There's a balance between getting input and building, you know, some consensus and getting feedback, but at some point making a decision, it won't be what everybody wanted and moving the organization forward. And I think I still tend towards maybe too much time on the consensus feedback. And I know that can also be detrimental because people are waiting for a decision. Yeah. So, Some decisions need there. to be made really fast. Right. Yes. And you and I talked about this before too, because you have on your team people with expertise and yeah. experience they're not looking to be promoted into a people leading position, but Correct. they are, they have tenure, right? They've been doing this right. for a long time yeah. and how they that is actually a track that more and more companies are trying to make a viable option for people. Cause not everybody is, you know, cut out to be a people leader, right. right. Or t- may not oh, want right. to. And that's okay. Right. Yeah. But they have a lot of experience. They've been through a lot of things before, mm-hmm. so they still want to be heard, right? Yeah. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, go ahead. What were you going to say, Liz? Sorry. So, no. yeah, and I was saying, especially in the organizations, um, and I'm sure others are like this too, that in research and development where you have very senior scientists and engineers, right, we actually really want them focused on the engineering and the science and having other people manage the people side of things because we need that expertise, but you're right. How to get their perspective and expertise into the decisions. Yes. And I think depending on the decision, you almost have to timeline it. Like how quickly do we need to make this decision? That's helpful. What can we do to get feedback from the group around, you know, like letting them know as much as possible about the parameters around the mm-hmm. decision, you know, what, okay. what's, what's based into it, right? It might be like, we have to cut the budget by 20%. And we have to let, mm-hmm. you know, we're being told we have to let go of one of these projects. So then you can develop like, we need quick mm-hmm. feedback, because we need to make this decision so that other things can happen. So then you decide the forum. Is it a survey? Is it a focus group? Is it one-on-one meetings, depending on how much time you have. You might also have subject matter experts. So Mm -hmm. maybe you're just pulling Mm -hmm. on your subject matter experts, but if it's a little more broad, you might just like take a pulse. I love that QR code survey. Like that was like quick and easy. And then you can move right into having a conversation about it. Is it the kind of decision where we could do a quick survey, Mm -hmm. get feedback? What what do you think the priority would be? Um, and then when a decision is made, like you said, you can't please everybody. Everybody has like different perspectives and things that they want, but you can give a rationale for why we made the decision we made. And I think most people, even if they don't love the decision, if they can understand why that decision was made, then they settle down. And I, I don't mean that I realize as I'm saying that, that that sounds like, like a negative thing, but they're like, they're, uh, they're less likely to get upset by the decision right. if they like, all right, I don't love it, but given uh, everything that had to play into this, I, I can see why that decision was made, 
and and then it's easier I'll to give get it a try. In. They might not be a hundred percent bought into like I love this idea. I'm a hundred percent behind it, but I'm buying right. in that I'm going to see what I can do to make it successful because that's what we've decided. Yeah, and then they feel a part of it. I think that's such a key piece, right? Of how do you let, make sure people feel that they were a part of it? That it is my manner. That, Really right. This. That is definitely something when we, we talk about like burnout and stress going a little too far. One of the yeah. things that contributes to burnout is not feeling like you have any control over your mm. workload or like what you're working on, that sort of thing. Yeah. So feeling yeah. like you're a part of the process and your voice is heard again, the decision may not be the one that they were hoping that you would make, but they feel like they contributed to it. They were able to have impact and they were thought of while you were trying to make the decision. And that gives them back some power. No, I really appreciate that insight of, and also turning it back to that burnout because right. I know we probably all have met people or experienced ourselves, especially lately that are kind of, the stress is just too much and that lack of control really resonates. Yeah. yeah. La I would, l last yeah. thing I just want to su sum up on, because when there's a lot yeah. of rapid changes, we can start to feel like the perception can be like, we're losing control. Like th this is all happening so fast and things are spinning so fast that like, even if we have, haven't really lost that much control, the perception is, is like, Oh my God, am I going to lose control? Like that sort of thing. So like as yeah. much as you can, like having people like it, creating yeah. experiences where people can feel like, okay, I have control over this this piece of my, world, all this other stuff might be changing, but like this square Definitely. that I stand in, I have some control here. No, that's something that kind of thinking even for myself, I think that's partially mm -hmm. why maybe I've been feeling to your word of overwhelmed is yeah. right. There's so much change going on and not being able to focus on here are the pieces I have control over, but you're right. right giving that to others on my team is equally important. Yeah. And what I'm hearing too, Liz, is um, giving yourself some grace too, right? You may a year or two look back and go, oh, I wish yeah. I'd been able to X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. But I want yeah. you to know in this moment, you are doing your best, right? And taking things one day at a time and doing your best every day, you'll be able to look back and go, sure, I wish, you know, right. things could have fallen out a different way or maybe like happened differently, but I yeah. know I did my best in every situation. Well, I really appreciate that. And it's definitely something I think for all of us hard to remember in the moment and saying like, my best is good enough that yeah. <laughs> you're really trying and right, give yourself grace. You give others grace all the time. And yet it's really hard to give to ourselves. Yes. And you're learning so much. Oh, yeah. So that fast. Is true. <laughs> <laughs> this has been an amazing education in the last, yeah, six months. So when I look at it that way, you're right. I couldn't have asked for anything better because it's exciting. It's it really exciting. interesting to learn new things. And, you know, you watch your, your kids or nieces and nephews absorbing knowledge. And sometimes you feel like, oh, that was my time has passed. But it's nice to kind of be back in the the throes of it. Yep. Learning, growing, expanding. <laughs> yes. And you strike me as someone who wants to continue to learn oh, and yeah. grow, right? Like this is your best right now. You can expand that, right? And you have expanded your best over the last six months, but it is yeah. going to take some grace, right? Because when we learn, we learn by sometimes making some mistakes, right? So they're going to happen, mm -hmm. but like, all in the name, like, here we go. All right. in the name of science, Liz, right? All yeah. in the name of learning and growing and, and all of that. But having yeah. grace in the midst of it, like, whoops, I should have included somebody in on this decision. <laughs> and they, oh, they got left yep. out. Owning it, apologizing for it, finding a way, changing the process to make sure nobody's, you know, the key people or mm -hmm. everyone isn't left out learn, grow, right? When you, the whole, um, when you know better, do better. That's really well put. And you're right. 
as a scientist in particular, a lot of great discoveries come from experiments not working. Really? <laughs> Some of the best. <laughs> yes. Yes. So it, it's, yeah. Why not? A, we should remember to apply it to our own lives. And yeah. yeah. And leadership. Good. Same thing. Right. We learn. Yes. It's definitely been. A, yeah. Definitely a learning experience. Well, Liz, this has been an absolute pleasure. So thank you so much for, for coming mm-hmm. on and for being vulnerable and opening up for everyone to learn, you know, as, as you were going through your own challenges and trying to find yeah. solutions. It's so helpful to hear other women talk about what they're going through. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity because then I think I was telling you, Jody, before we started the timing, really how I couldn't be more perfect and it seems like things are been pretty tumultuous lately. And sometimes it's like, well, I don't even have time. So I talk to Jody for an hour. It's like, wait, no, that's actually the reason to take the time because I really could use some help and advice. So thank you. I can't tell you how many times clients of mine have said that, like, I almost canceled (laughs) this meeting because it's so busy. And and at the end of our time together, they're like, I'm so glad. I'm yeah. so glad I did not cancel this appointment. This is exactly what I needed. Sometimes we just Agreed. need that space to just step away from things and like talk about it like very logically, I guess. Right. Because in the thick of it, when you're fighting fires, it's not logical, right? No, no. Very emotional. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you, Liz. Thank you so much for listening to the Women Taking the Lead podcast. If you are not yet subscribed to the podcast, hit the follow or subscribe button so you don't miss out on the upcoming episodes. And if you know other women and men who can benefit from this episode, please share it with them. Most new discoveries come from our friends, family, and colleagues. As always, I hope this was of value to you. And here's to your success.